I want to welcome everyone here to the service this morning. Let's go before the Lord in prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, I pray that you reveal to us through your word your perfect will. I pray, Father God, that you speak to us, Lord God. We have come here today with anticipation and expectation. And Lord God, we know that you have something for us. We pray, Father God, an anointing upon our ears and our hearts that we would be ready to receive what you have for us. Lord God, let us be found to be doers and not just hearers, though. Let us put into action all of the things that we learn today from your word. Father God, as we receive your word today, let us be quick to share that word with someone this week. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We are in the midst of a six-week program looking at uh, financial freedom, and we're meeting here at on Wednesday nights at 6 p.m., we've all come together and we're working through a, a workbook on eight money milestones. And we begin to look at specifically what Bible based uh, debt free living looks like. But I really like what John Wesley had to say. John Wesley, who was the father of um, Methodism, said this, and it sums up our entire six weeks. He said, Make all you can. Save all you can, and give all you can. That is what biblically-based financial freedom looks like. It's basically what's considered to be a zero-sum game. Everything that comes into us goes out, and there is nothing left over because everything we have received in, we have either placed in the savings or we have placed into the kingdom of God to be used, to be able to be put to use. Everything, and that's what we've been focusing on. Today we study on the first step of the classes that we're going through and that we're leading in the Bible study. And the first step is tithing. We don't hear a lot about that in the church anymore. Tithing, T-I-T-H-I-N-G. It's a fancy word that simply means the tenth. Specifically, though, I want to look today at what I call hilarious giving. Hilarious giving. Giving. How many of you have ever been in bed at night looking at something on your phone, reading something, and you read something or see something, and you just, you can't help but laugh, and you laugh out loud, and you begin to shake, and apparently I have that Santa Claus thing, I laugh like a bowl of jelly, and Marcy will always wake up and elmo me, because I just saw something that was hilarious, that something was just such extreme that it would make me just laugh out loud. Maybe some of you are snort laughers. You, you know, you maybe one of you may be married to a snort laugher, and they laugh so hard they just they snort. It's just something so out of the ordinary, something f- so funny that it just shakes them up. Maybe I, I've got recently, since we've got a grandbaby coming, I've gotten sucked into these videos of babies laughing, and, and, and just it just your your blood pressure goes down, and you, your endorphins go up. You, just to see someone so happy, as happy as a child is. It is a wonderful thing. You know what? God, your Father, wants to see you happy. We want to see our children happy. We love to hear our children laugh. God wants to see you happy. That may shock you. All of you live in a fear of God. God wants to see you happy. And He wants to see you giving, but He wants to see you giving hilariously. We're going to look at several different spots in the Word of God today. And one of the examples I'm going to look at is in the parable of the, the, the prodigal father. Now often you maybe have heard that referred to as the parable of the prodigal son. But in looking at the definition of prodigal, and I'm not going to go in a lot of Greek because I don't know a lot of Greek, but looking in the prodigal, the word prodigal means to spend money or resources freely, recklessly, wastefully extravagant. We often speak of the prodigal son because we realize how he spent his money, how he took what his father had given him. And, and understand, remember this boy. This boy went to his father and said, essentially, I wish you were dead. He said, I want my inheritance today. I wish you were dead. I want everything that comes to me, and I want it today. So we speak of this son. He got all of that, and he just spent it, and just wastefully spent it. But one of the fathers, what would be considered at the time reckless restoration in terms of mercy, forgiveness, and yes, money that he gave to his son. 
Whenever we begin to read the story of the prodigal, we often see the relation in time that whenever they would heard the story that the, this boy went to his father and said, I want my inheritance now, the crowd would have gasped because they immediately knew what that meant, that he wished his father was dead. But just as so would they have been so thrown off whenever they read and heard that the father took his son back, didn't make him a servant or a slave, but instead he restored him. He gave him the ring. He put clothes upon him. He had a party. He restored him in fullness to being his son. They would have called that reckless, wasteful, they would have said, because he's already got his inheritance. Why are you putting more out upon him? And I think that Paul had that in mind whenever Paul began to speak in 2 Corinthians 9 and 7. Paul said this, Each must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. The prodigal father owed his son nothing. He owed him less than nothing, as a matter of fact. But yet he poured out everything upon him. And Paul said that God loves a cheerful giver. Cheerful is from the Greek word hilaros, which is where we get the word hilarious from. Something that is so far out of the norm that it just rolls you over and splits your side. It means hilarious, but it also means joyful. How many of you can use a little more joy in your life? Is, is it just me? Amen. The world's going to give you everything but joy. But God has told you that what I want to see is that for you to give, and I want you to give joyfully above and beyond because I want to see you happy when you give. Well, we always say more blessed to give than to receive because if you can give it, that means you've got it. That's right. If you got it, you're happy to give it away, right? If you've got it, you're happy to give it away. How you can always tell when it's a bumper crop of tomatoes or cucumbers because they start stacking up on the table out there, right? Please take them. Please take them. Please take them. You're happy to give them away because you have an abundance. Church, we have an abundance. We, we live sometimes as though we don't have abundance. We, we, we stress freedom this past few weeks. Oh, we were able to do this, we are able to do that. We've always been able to do these things. We just don't celebrate them. We have abundance. We should be able to give freely, without compulsion, without having any no guilt trip upon us. We give because we have been blessed. You know, there's another parable Jesus told, and big surprise, it was about money. You do understand that the vast majority of Jesus' parables are about money. Or at least on the surface, they seem to be about money. It was the most popular topic used in his parables and many of the stories that he told. Uh, Matthew chapter 20, verse 1 through 16. Um, you remember the story, we call it the parable of the generous farmer. I call it the prodigal farmer now. And it's a story of the vineyardsman, it was time to harvest, and he began to send people out and bring in workers. And he had some workers that worked all day long. Now, I can imagine it was a day all day long, just like yesterday was. It was hot. I had things that I needed to do. I needed to clean out the gutters before this storm came in. But I set aside the last hour of the day to be able to do it. Well, in the story, the parable of the generous farmer, those workers that had been in the field all day long, and a day back then would have been no less than 12 hours, the ones that had been in the field 12 hours a day and those that had been in the field one hour a day were all paid the same wages, a full day's pay. Now, understand, those that got there late, they expected to just be paid for part of a day. They didn't expect it all, but the farmer gave everything to them because he had it. He had something that needed to be done. He had a harvest that needed to be brought in. So those who came in early, he blessed them. Those who came in late, he blessed them. God has given us one thing that we are to do. We are to be harvesters. We're to be sent. He told us, look, the fields are white for harvest. And he sent us out there in the Great, Com Great Commission to do this, to bring in the harvest. So whether you've been in the church 80 years like some of you have or eight minutes, your reward is the same. He is free in his giving. 
He is a prodigal farmer, a generous farmer. He gave freely more than what was required. So given these examples, what sort of givers are we to be? Now when we talk about giving in the church, a lot of time immediately there's a few verses and sections that some preachers are going to go to. And a lot of them are going to go to Luke chapter 6, verse 38. Luke 6, 38, those of us who came up through the charismatic movement in the early days in the mid late 70s, there are some things that were stressed over and over and over again, and we heard this scripture over and over and over again. It says, give, and you will receive. Your gift will return to you in full, pressed down, shaken together, to make room for more, running over, poured into your lap. The amount you give will determine the amount you get back, and then they take the offering. What you give determines how much you get back. And they would do it with great animation. And they would push it and stress it. Unless you give, you can't receive. The more you give, the more you receive. And they'd give that over and over and over and over again. And they'd take an offering. And sometimes they'd take another offering. I love one of the churches, the pastor, he took the offering and they took it to the back. And the back doors, you hear the back doors open and Two deacons were standing out there, and they looked at the pastor, and they shook their head. He said, nope, take up another offering. They went back to the inn, came back, and they shook their head. He said, I got nowhere to go. Three times they come back, and they nodded their head. He said, all right. But they had been pushed into giving, pushed into giving, pushed into giving. Some people use that to tell you that to give more to the church so that in return God will give you more. They will tell you that over and over and over again. That's why so many churches today don't talk about wealth. They don't talk about health because the TV preachers and some of these other ones took that away from us because that's all they stressed over and over and over and over again. They abused the topic to prey upon the people and they robbed from the people. Not just their money, but they rob from the people the opportunities to be truly blessed through joyful giving. Not giving that was compulsory. Not anything that was like a gun held to their heads. But all scripture should be taken in context. And when you look at Luke chapter 6 verse 38, you see that Jesus was actually talking about mercy. As you give mercy, you will receive mercy. Pressed down, shaking over, rolling, 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 rolling over. Not rolling over, running over. There we go. That you, Whatever you give, that's how you're going to get it back. If you give justice, you're going to receive justice. That's what he was talking about. Over and over and over again, he kept telling them that. You give mercy and justice to others, that's how you're going to expect to receive mercy and justice. But we look at the Bible as a whole in true context. Sometimes what I don't mean, context means you go back a verse or two or a chapter. Look at the whole book. Look at the whole Bible. Not just the immediate context. And we see where Jesus used over and over and over again money as an example. And he used it as an example to show us the consequences of disobedience if we are not free and joyful in our giving. There's a consequence to it. He's telling you there's a punishment I want you to avoid if you are not obedient to what God has told you to do. A consequence of not giving freely that which we've received. Now that may be mercy and that may be justice, but you know what? It may also be money. I said Jesus spoke more about money than any other topic in his parables. And why is that? It's because it's something the rich and the poor equally understand. If you go to someone who's poor and says, look, the topic's money. Give me the one word when I tell you money. What do you need? More. I go to the rich. I got a few people I don't want to avoid eye contact with. You got to know who you are. I got the rich people. And I go to the rich people and I say, look, the topic's money. You got to need a one word answer. Word, topic's money. I need, and what are they going to tell me? More. They stand in agreement, whether rich or poor. What do they need? More. J. John Paul Getty, richest man in the world at the time. Today's, today's numbers, he would have been a trillionaire. They went to him one day when he was in his 80s. They said, John Paul, J. Paul, 
what, what, how much more, how much money do you need? How much money do you need? And you know what his answer was? More. More. So Jesus spoke to the rich, to the poor, and he spoke to them about money. One of the parables Jesus told of a servant, and the servant owed the king what in today's dollars would have been a million dollars. I don't know what this fella did that he was so far and so corrupt that he stole a million dollars. I'm pretty sure he was elected to office, to give you an idea. When, when, I see, um, when I see how these people live that are paid on 80000 a year or even the president at 200000 a year, and I see all these houses and all the things they have stacked up, well, somehow this servant of the king owed the king a million dollars. And the king says, look, I'm going to throw you in jail. You're going to be in jail until your family raises enough money to be able to get you out of jail. He began to beg to the king and beg to the king. Finally, the king in his goodness, I imagine the king was like our government. He just print the money himself. The king just said, you know what? You're forgiven. You're forgiven. Just get out of here. You're forgiven. Immediately, the man who was forgiven walked out of the, the, the courtyard there where the king was meeting. He walked out immediately in the street, saw a man that owed him $1,000, grabbed that man by the neck, he said, where is my $1,000? The guy said, oh, I can't, I can't have it, I, can't, I don't have it, I can't pull it. He had that man thrown into jail until his family could work off the debt. Well, somebody happened to see what happened, and they went back to the king and said, let me tell you, the guy you pardoned of a million dollars just threw another guy in jail for $1,000. And let's look at Matthew chapter 18 and see what the king's response was. Matthew 18, verse 32 to 34. Then the king called in the man he had forgiven and said, You evil servant, I forgave you that tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? Then the angry king sent the man to prison to be tortured until he had paid his entire debt. Originally, the king was going to send him off to prison until his family paid the debt. This time I'm a senior prison, and you're going to be tortured the entire time until they pay off your debt. So I'm going to make it even worse upon you because of the fact that you did not show mercy. Not because you stole a million dollars from me, but because you did not show mercy. Luke chapter 12, verse 48. Words of Jesus, he says what? To much is given, much is required. How many of you in here, you don't have to raise your hand, but I want to wonder how many of you in here have accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior? You've accepted the mercy given you by Jesus Christ, the freedom given you by Jesus Christ, the blessings given to you by Jesus Christ. What have you done with them? Have you shared that? Oh, uh, how am I supposed to share mercy? By giving mercy. The other way you share mercy is by sharing your testimony. Don't just keep it inside. Tell others what God has done for you. God has blessed you. What have you done with that that he's given to you? We've all been given that mercy and the salvation in Jesus Christ. Most of us in here have been made comfortable. Not rich, but most of us in here have a house, a roof over our heads, a vehicle to get back and forth to, a job to drive to. Air conditioning, thank God. And look, let me tell you, if you don't have air conditioning, you come find me after church. Because it's right up there with, with three days of water till you die, 40 days of food. Well, it's about, and in this way, it's about a half a day without air conditioning. It's a necessity. We have been given that. And what have we done with it? Do we reflect in our lifestyles that that we show mercy and that we show freedom and hilarity in our giving to others equal to what God poured out for us. We say we're Christians, and we know every week we talk about it, to be a Christian simply means to be what? Like Christ. Do you give as freely as Christ gave to you? Are you as quick to give as Christ gave to those that he encountered? The woman at the well, Nicodemus. 
All of these that he came in contact with. The thief on the cross next to him. Are you, are you free in your giving in that manner? So I don't have any money. What happened to the beggar when Peter came up there and he said, Give me, give me, give me. He says, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have I give you. Give what you have, people. Because I'm going to give you a shocker here. What you have, it ain't yours. It is not yours. How many of us are like Christ? Or how many of us are like the prodigal father that were quick to give and quick to restore people to where they were? Somebody does you wrong, and we say in a boy's parish, I don't know about evangelism parish, a boy's parish, we say, I put an X on the wall. I'm done with them. How many are you so quick to do that to people? How about I said we welcome them back again? Are we like the prodigal father? Are we like the generous farmer? Do we give to those people that other people say, I wouldn't give them a nickel. They don't deserve it. You ever heard that? Are you quick to be able to give to those people? Are you quick to be able to love those that are hard to love? How about that? Are we like the servant, giving so much more than we deserve, but we withhold the same mercy from others? The evil servant. And yes, I got to tell you this. Sometimes mercy has a dollar value. Somebody might owe you some money. And you know what? Sometimes you just have to write it off. You know what you tell them? Look. That that you owe me, instead I want you to go give that to somebody else. The world now, they call it what? Paying forward. Somebody's going to need something. You owe me that, but I tell you what, give that to somebody else. Just, just keep it going. Keep it going. What is God asking you to give? I can promise you this. He's not asking you to give anything that's not already His. I'm going to paraphrase Mark Twain a little bit. I mentioned this the other night where it says that Simply the fact that when it comes to what is God and what's not God, God's on the, God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. God owns the hills. And God owns the gold in them, their hills. It's all God's. He's asking you to give back to Him what is already and was already His. If anything, He's loaned you things. And may I tell you this too, He's not asking for you to give it back because He needs it, all right? God's not in need. God's not going to give you something, and then it changes my say, Oh, no, give that back to me. There's a term we used to use about a giver like that, but we can't use that term anymore. But we used to could say that. Well, that ain't God. God's not like that. He's not one of those. He doesn't need it back. God wants you to give it back because that shows obedience. God has told us what? To obey is better than sacrifice. Oh, well, if I give, oh, that's so hard, that's so hard, what's such a sacrifice? No, it's obedience. It's not the sacrifice that got you worried, it's the obedience that's got you worried. That's where it comes into. I was listening the other day to, there, there are very few Catholic nuns anymore, and it was in the healthcare field. A uh, woman was speaking, to her, she was part of the uh, Christa system now, you speak Cabrini. And they talked now that they can't get anyone to be able to come into the order anymore. And they said, well, what's, what's, what's the problem? I says, well, we have them. There's three things you must do before you can become a nun or be able to come in. They said, the first thing is you have to take a vow of poverty. And they said, well, I don't have anything anyway. That, that's no problem. They said, there's a vow of chastity. He said, well, that ain't got nothing but trouble. Anyway, I can give that up. It's no problem. They said, the third is a vow of obedience. They say, whoop. They blow the whistle on that. There's a lot of things that we will give to God, give to others, but the thing we hold back for is that we do not quickly obey. And we come out of the womb like that. Kids, some of the first words that our kids are going to learn is going to be what? No. Why do they learn that word so quick? Because they heard that word so many times. No, no, no. We used to say, you know, by the dog we had. He thought his name was no, no, bad dog. Because that's all we hear. They, they're just born disobedient. And we are the same way. What God wants us is to give him, is give him obedience. 
And the reason is to avoid the punishment that comes from disobedience. Now, God doesn't want to rule you in the negative that you do everything you can just because you're scared of God. God wants you to give hilariously and freely and cheerfully because you are so happy for what he has given you. You are, you are quick and easy in your obedience. What, what if this? What if God, instead of asking you to give 10% of your money, what if God said, I want 10% of your health? Uncle Lionel here, he may have one good day out of 14. When he's got strength, he's able to move around. One good day out of 14. What if God says, you know what, Lionel, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to take that day from you. I'm, I'm, I'm going to take that day away from you. I'm going to take your health from you. How many of you have days in here where maybe you're free from anxiety or free from pain? What if God says, you know, no, I don't want your money. I'm going to take those good days from you. How about your life? What if God says out of the 75 years that you have set aside, I'm going to take seven and a half of those years, 24 hours a day for seven and a half years, dedicated to me and to my service. What if God took that from you? What if you're breaking a little smaller scale and God says, I want 17 hours of your week, 10% of your week given in service to me. It's hard enough to get people to come to church for an hour or an hour and a half. What if God took 10% of our time? But all he has asked for is what? 10% of the money that he's already given to us. It's his. I'm going to give you all a simple fact when it comes to money. And you, you may believe me, you may not believe me, and that's all right too. If you can't live on 90% of your gross income, I promise you, you can't live on 100%. If your margin is that tight in a business or anything else, you're not going to make it. If you can't live on 90%, there's no way you're going to be able to make it on 100%. In Malachi chapter 3 and verses 8, God speaks to his people through the prophet Malachi. And he says this, he said, Shall people cheat God? Yet you have cheated me. But you ask, what do you mean? When did we ever cheat you? You've cheated me of the tithes and the offerings due to me. You are under a curse. For your whole nation has been cheating me. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse so there will be enough food in my temple. If you do, says the Lord of heaven's armies, I will open the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great that you won't have enough room to take it in. And the only place in the Bible God adds this. Try it. Put me to the test. What is he uh, testing? He is testing your obedience. What does he want you to test? His faithfulness. His faithfulness to his word. His faithfulness to his will. He says, put me to the test. The first step to Bible-based financial freedom. If you made it Wednesday night, that's great. If not, you can catch up this Wednesday. We've got some books in the back. Let me know. And we'll be glad to get you one. So there's a good bit of homework in here, and there's some worksheets. But the first step is simply this, and it's in the right order. The first step is giving. The first step is giving your tithe to the church. 10% of your gross pay. Everything that you are paid. And they said, oh, well, no, well, I'll wait till I pay this or they got to take out taxes. Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 23, teaches us this. And this is the Living Bible translation. It says in Deuteronomy 14, 23b, the purpose of tithing is to teach you always to put God first in your lives. Back in the day, if you were a farmer or you raised chickens or whatever it was, you wouldn't have cash, you wouldn't have money, but you would bring into the storehouse the first fruits, the best part of your harvest, whatever it may be, that's what you would bring. It is no different today. Then we can begin to experience the joy and reward of hilarious giving that comes from obedience, living an obedient life. And remember this, giving... Offerings don't start until after the tithe. I'm going to tell you something else, too, and you may read up on me. The tithe, tithe means tenth. There is nothing that I'm going to stand before you and say, I'm telling you that you've got to give 10%. 10%, 10%. I'm not going to hold you to that. Because if God wants you to give 15, 20, 25%, then that's what you have to give. 
Scripture told us it's only laid upon a man to the heart that which he must give. And I want you to be and do so in deep prayer. Whenever we get to the point that we're actually giving to God a portion back, which is already his, and we're living in obedience, that is when God can bless us. He will never bless us if we are in disobedience. Tithing is the obedience that prevents the punishment of God that comes from robbing God. But our true Christian life is not, again, it's not about being in fear. It's about the joy of living an abundant life, not the fear and the consequences of what comes when we live in a life to avoid death and lack. God wants to bless you. God is the original analogy in here of the generous prodigal giver. God is the joyful giver. God is the one who gives above and beyond. Why would he not expect us to do the same. Look, this whole week we've been celebrating freedom, freedom, freedom. We celebrate freedom. But you know what? You can't be free if you're in debt. And so, well, how can you say that? Well, I don't have to say it. Solomon told me in Proverbs 22, 7, he says, the, borrow is, the borrower is the slave of the lender. For years we used to say, oh, man, I like your house. That's a nice house. Well, it ain't my house. Who owns it? The bank. Bank's house. Bank's got a nice house. I think the bank got a lot of nice cars by me looking out there in the parking lot. I'm not going to take inventory, but the bar was the slave of the lender. And the very first step to getting out of debt is giving, tithing. That's, that's the opposite of the world may say. Oh, the opposite of the world may say, well, we need to save, we need to hoard, we need to pull all these things. No, the first step is in giving. And again, remember, what did Malachi tell you? The words of God, try it, put me to the test. I'm a big fan of Billy Graham. We were supposed to have been out at his place at the Cove a few weeks ago. I've been a big fan of Billy Graham. If you go back and watch all his crusades, now he was not one to harp or ask for money. All of that stuff, that was all taken care of normally by private givers. He was never one of these ones, oh, send me this, send me this, blah, blah, blah. But this is what Billy Graham said. Billy Graham says if a person gets his attitude toward money straight, it will help straighten out almost every other area in his life. You can see how someone manages things. What we used to say, if I really want to know someone, I need to look at two things. I need to look at their checkbook and their calendar. If I want to know what's important in someone's life. Billy Graham says, if you can't manage your money, you're not managing everything else either. That's just an outward symbol. I got somebody I know, and I don't I didn't give his name. He goes a little farther. He's a... He, he's a preacher that I know. He said, he'll go to the parking lot looking in the window of people's cars. He said, I can judge your soul by looking in your floorboard of your vehicle. That's a bit extreme, but you can do see if someone's not managing this, what's in this span of their space, of their control, if they're not managing that, then chances are they're not managing the vertical either. If you're not caring, caring of those things and those people right around you, then what things are you managing? The things that count for eternity. Billy Graham said, they said, look at someone. Look how they manage their money. In another Jesus parables, again, the surface, it looked like money, but he was talking about, but he was giving us a warning. And it was the one we all know about the parable of the talents, the, the owner who went away and gave to his Managers, one five bags of silver, one two bags of silver, and one one bag of silver. He gave to them according to what he thought they could manage, is what he really did. He used good judgment. He said, I'm going to give you five, you two, and I don't really know you. I'm going to give you one. Let's see what comes out. And you know what? They met what he expected. The, the two that met his expectations, he gave them more. He gave them double. But I want you to focus on the one that did not meet the expectations of the master. He took away everything that he had. He was evil. He actually robbed God. He robbed his master because he at least could have, he told me, Master, you could have put it in the bank and earned interest. You did nothing with what I gave you. Nothing. There are people that have been in the church their entire lives and they have done nothing with what God has done for them. They have, there is no increase. He said, how can you say that? I said, because I do not see 
an increase of what God gave to them. And what God gave to them was the lost. God told us, he said, I give you the world as an inheritance. I give you these people out here who don't know me. I'm giving them to you. I'm using you to go forward and bring them in. And there's too many empty seats in here for me to believe that everyone has put to use those things that they have been given. And I'm not talking about just people here in the pews. Understand that? There are people that should have been here, that knew to be here, and were supposed to be here, and they did not come. And they are every bit as responsible for the word that I'm putting out as you that came. So you just assume come and drink free coffee and free AC because you're responsible for the word. If you could have been here and chose not to, you are responsible for every word that's put forward here today. What are they doing with it? So I ask the question, where are you in your faithfulness? And I've got one simple judge for that, and that's, again, the words of Christ. To much is given, much is required. Have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior? Is there anyone in here that has not accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior? The cameras are off. Don't worry about any of that. Is there anyone here who has not accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior? And today's the day that they need to receive the free gift of salvation that he's offering. Anyone in here today? Everyone in here has accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior, has accepted the gift of salvation. Then stand to your feet. Everyone in this place. Lord God, I hold as an example those in this building that stand to their feet, Lord God, that they've accepted your salvation, your gift, your mercy, your grace. I pray, Lord God, that as it has been given to them, that you hold them accountable. My, those that isn't given, much is given, much is required. I hold you, Lord God, that you hold them and me as I stand here on my two feet. You hold us all accountable, Lord God, that we are going to use the gift that you've given us, the gift of mercy, the gift of love, the gift of salvation, the gift of eternal life. And Lord God, let us share that with others this week. Father God, let us be generous. Let us be hilarious in our giving. And Father God, we ask only one thing, that you bring into our path this week those people, Lord God, who need to see Christ exhibited through our actions. Lord God, we ask all these things in the abundance of your great storehouse of heaven. Lord God, pour out your mercy and pour out your blessings upon us that we may pour into the lives of others. And all these things I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Leave from here in the freedom of Christ and bring a lot of people with you when you come back. I want to see you Wednesday night at 6 p.m. I want to see you Sunday mornings in Sunday school at 10 a.m. and back here at 11 a.m. for service next week.